I guess both of us would be kind of described as IDW adjacent. Um, would you like to, I'd just like if you could just talk about your, your own background for a, for a bit. What's your bio? Oh, sure. I mean, I'm, uh, I used to just say documentary filmmaker because that seemed to mean something in the world. I'm not sure what it means, but that, you know, I come from the independent documentary filmmaking world, uh, went to school for, for film, um, started, I guess, asking more, let's call it IDW-ish political questions in college when 9-11 hit when I was a sophomore. And that really started a lot of the gears in my mind moving in the direction of maybe where certain questions have, have come out. And finally, a couple years ago, just dove in after sort of frustration was boiling over and um, reached out to a group that was hosting Sam Harris and Majid Nawaz in Australia. Things moved pretty quickly and suddenly we were making a documentary based on the collaboration between Majid and Sam and, and I guess that alerted you know my presence to some, some IDW folks and or whatever this word means that I'm sure we'll talk about. It, I don't know the word now, I guess when people ask me what I do and I say content creator it sounds really <laughs> thin but I guess that's what it is. I'm a content creator in the philosophical um, and intellectual space. So that's podcasts and documentaries. There's, there's a few and, of us around. <laughs> yeah, whatever we are, you know, anything that moves and makes noise and has pictures, we kind of touch and and hopefully try to do some good with it. So yeah, we're in the same boat there. But I guess we're pointing our cameras at some some ideas that would be considered IDW. So that makes us <laughs> literally adjacent to them in many cases. Yeah. Yeah, adjacent enough to be able to see it and film it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and hopefully adjacent enough that hopefully people like us do our homework a little bit, which means you're gonna to have to expose yourself to these ideas and, and see the, what's good about them, what's bad about them, try to poke around at the dangers, hopefully take sort of a critical eye um, to some of the, the ideas because presumably we, we care about them in, in, some, in some way. Do, do you have a definition for the IDW or for the wider? I mean, I, I sort of look at it as the IDW is the named part of a, of a broader movement. And, and it's sort of maybe you have to disentangle those things as well to see what is the emergent phenomenon that the IDW is the sort of named part of. Yeah, I, I don't know, actually. And, and this is why it becomes so hard to talk about when the definition is so, you know, loose to begin with. I have what I wish it would be. I think even Barry in that initial article sort of pondered. What I want it to be is this. What I want it to be is people who are connected by their common pursuit of truth and unafraid to ask taboo or let's call it politically incorrect questions to find that truth. That could be, you know, it's people who are unafraid to wander into the waters of IQ and race or religion and violence and, you know, these things that sort of make people cringe. You know, everyone says famously when you get at the dinner table, don't talk about politics or religion. This is a group of people who are like, we're going to talk about politics and religion because it matters and we're trying to get somewhere. Um, but that, that pursuit, if it's a pursuit of truth in some sort of abstract way, that's uh, a, something I've written about, but that's a philosophical pursuit, trying to find truth. And where I think it can, the, the cracks that are showing in the IDW that I worry about is if it becomes a political movement. I, I define them very distinctly that a philosophical effort is one where you're seeking to find truth, again, just sort of agnostically just truth for its own sake. And then the political movement is trying to figure out how to be effective, which is, which is agnostic of truth. Uh, you could be the worst person in the world, like Pol Pot, you know, that regime was very political. I obviously disagree with their philosophical precepts, but they, figured, they were figuring out how to move people from point A to point B, and you could do it with progressive movements or any movement. And if the IDW becomes, you know, the difference between being a journalist and an activist is a really interesting conversation. And if it, if it becomes politicians rather than philosophers in that mindset, then, then I think it's rightful to attack it. And I think the cracks will, will probably crumble it in some ways. You sort of pretend like no one's listening. You, you pretend like you're not going to get in trouble for the questions you ask there. We see that, that that's probably naive, which is why it inherently has to become a little political because people are watching. And so your words matter. And there is, no matter how philosophical you want to be, there is always a bit of a, uh, a risk to saying things publicly. Even anything I say here, I assume it will be seen. And so having just a uh, let's call it a, a, a moral filter on what you say is, is probably a good thing for all of us to ponder. But I think the IDW, if it was anything, was a, 
a recognition that that filter had gotten so thick that people were just self-censoring themselves in these extreme ways, and it really mattered, particularly the, the acceleration of it after 9-11, where, where I jumped into it with the film I made, was I think noticing that that filter was so thick that it was actually doing real, real damage, and we could be headed, and maybe we are now, you know, with the Trump moment we could talk about, maybe we, we have wandered into those waters where the filter actually was counterproductive. So uh, hopefully the IDW is dissolving the filter and you know seeing what we find. But I, I worry that it, it's failing to live up to that potential in a lot of, a lot of circles. A mutual friend of ours, uh, Ryan Bennett, I think came up with something I think is really, really useful called the IDW protocol. And I, yeah. might, and, I, and I might flash that up on screen. He's got it pinned to his Twitter um, yeah, yeah. bio, but it's three principles that I think are as good as anything as to defining what the IDW protocol as a kind of method of interacting rather than a content is brilliant. Do you, what do you make of that? If I could pick up some of the like uh, platform and incentive things, because it's interesting, I didn't go through the newsroom like you did, I was always sort of in the independent world. And in my world, it was, I would see, I think, the kinds of things that you saw daily only at the end of my process, usually at the end of my process. Like I would make a whole film and sort of be on an island. Maybe I would have some investors who really just believed in what I was doing or the story was sort of, you know, angel money. And in the end, when you're talking to distributors and where you're going to show this thing, that's when suddenly all of these other incentives of like, oh, wait, like you need commercials and like this needs to be a certain length and all those other factors that, you know, it, I, you were running into in the newsroom. It's like the incentives here, are, you have 30 seconds for a sound bite and you better make it good, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I was exposed to it at a very different part of the pipeline than you were in, in our sort of media upbringings. Um, but I think it's a really important point maybe to linger on about the dangers. I know this is something we'll wade into more, but you're talking about the, the innocent sort of start of like, hey, I just want to have different conversations and I'm really dissatisfied with what I'm seeing and sort of the mainstream or my friends are talking about and kind of afraid to talk about. That's, that's like a great, like innocent little kind of thing. But, you know, you start to pick up steam and pretty soon you have people watching and then pretty soon there's people with money and then pretty soon there's commercials and pretty soon it's like there's this habit in humanity of you want to like reinvent the wheel every time but we always keep fucking just like rebuilding the same thing that we all, that we tore down. And I think we're in the IDW, maybe someone like Rogan that you mentioned or all the other names that I'm sure we'll get into eventually start to f feel the pressure of these incentives that we feel like we got away from. And some people have been really successful about, about um, they're lucky, I think, but about getting away from those incentives of like, we're not going to be ad based and maybe models like just user um, Patreon kind of stuff is a way to break out of that model. Maybe it is. We're all trying to sort of figure it out. But this, I, I think you're hinting at sort of the, the phenomenon of audience capture of the the feedback loop certainly of financial gain when you do something and suddenly your wallet grows and then you just start to tend to do that thing again and wherever the psychology comes into that process of sort of you know knowingly well I'm going to repeat the process or you just start feeling good because of your wallet and then the story emerges in your mind and you're doing some post hoc rationalization that's dangerous stuff I mean we obviously we've seen it all in the news media that the channels seem to split further more extreme and more you know further left and further right and it incentivizes if the mandate is just get viewers get clicks we know sort of where that could lead. It'll amplify maybe the darkest parts of our psychology that get addicted to outrage and all this kind of stuff that we see. I, I think it would be really naive to pretend that starting a YouTube channel with the intention of not, of escaping all that means you will have successfully escaped it. It will chase you and it will find you. And it's, a, and, and it's real. It's real, potent, dangerous stuff. And I, I think we should have a level of... Um, not apologetics for someone who falls in prey to it, but sympathy for them. And I'm sure we, we can name names of the people who may have fallen prey to that, but we should also admit that that, that stuff is like old, old psychology that everyone deals with on a personal day-to-day -day level of sort of the ends justify the means. It's like, well, I worked all day at Auschwitz, but I got paid. You know, like that's the extreme version of it. But you go to your job and you do your thing and maybe you're participating in some kind of 
system that that you know has some moral cost to it but in the end the ends justify the means and I, I think it's it's a dangerous it's a dangerous way to live. Again, it's nothing new. It's it happens in every sort of field that we see in sort of an open capitalist society that we always have to contend with because, you know, it's it's attractive. It's attractive even just getting the likes. Even if you're not making any money in in this sort of conversation, but you get a bunch of retweets and likes. I think we all check our notifications and we all have to admit the dopamine hit that we see when we see a high number is is a real thing that we have to contend with. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly just, feel it myself. I feel like, it too. like I, I just, just the, the fact that there is a comment thread and knowing what the audience like and what they don't like, you, you can, I mean, if you, you'd have to not be human to not, to not feel that in some way. Yeah, 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 I feel it too. And um, I think we should be honest about that and, and be able to laugh at it a little bit. And I think to sort of zoom out a little bit of, you know, you and I have talked a lot before and I keep coming back to this line of uh, the danger, the dangers that lurk in something like the IDW conversation or even followers and fans of it is, you know, once this mistake that, I, that I've come to, uh, to notice or, or basically profess is that there seems to be a trend of people who think the moment that they have rejected bad philosophy or a bad philosophy, it also means they've rejected bad psychology and they really have nothing to do with each other. So, you know, if you find this maybe in a way like I did through like an atheist conversation and you, you think you're so brilliant because you rejected some carpenter zombie story 2000 years ago and, and you know, now you think, oh, I've solved the world and I'm, I'm all set. Great. It's true. You've rejected one really dumb, bad idea and you could get deep into that. But it doesn't mean you're not susceptible to the lures of status and sex and money and all of these other things. And even some, if someone rejects a political leaning, being like, oh, I've noticed that the left is really wacky and has gone overboard and look, like I'm, I, I woke to this in sort of the red pill way or either side of that, if whatever your political epiphany is, that doesn't mean you've escaped the normal trappings that we all deal with of weak psychology and and they they relate but they don't they don't they don't correlate the way that i think a lot of people tend to to jump the gun and think they have um, and that goes for the personalities in the idw that goes for the big names that we all know who are on stage that goes for people like you and i who are trying to sort of tell the story of these people it goes for people following it i think we all have to just sort of be honest about that again laugh about it a little bit it's if there's anything that binds us as humans together that would be a great thing to sort of you know <laughs> find common ground even with your political enemy is like we're all susceptible to these kind of things we should admit that and then what you do with it is is really important because i think there that's a huge moment in a personal life that's a huge moment in a, in a political or philosophical movement are you going to reject that part of psychology and do everything you can to suppress it and and overcome it and reach some kind of nirvana to use like a religious term that's, that's an effort that a lot of people take on and maybe successfully. Or are you going to admit that these are trappings that um, not only even calling them trappings might be too negative. These are f facets of a human psychology that can actually be beautiful and provide a lot of meaning. And we need to figure out a way to massage them and h maybe hijack them for ethical ends. It's, it, the word actually, a good word to sort of ponder with it is virtue signaling. I hate when people use the word virtue signaling. It's something we do, and of course, we see sort of the really disingenuous version of it, the virtue signaling that's just like over the top and clearly just makes your eyes roll the way I just sort of did on camera. But I think we should all admit that we all, we're all we always virtue signaling in some, in some way. And there's, a, there's an ability, that, again, it's the same choice. Are you gonna just try to deny that you virtue signal? And that anyone virtue signals and this should be something that we stamp out in sort of human psychology if we're going to make any progress or do you recognize it as a as a as a maybe even necessary but permanent feature of human psychology that we just have to not even contend with but take care of and make sure it's amplified towards ethical ends i, I think that's a really really interesting philosophical split and psychological split that i don't know I could like pin IDW characters in either direction on that split, but it's a split we don't talk about often enough because we just sort of deny that. It, we, every, I think everyone assumes the right answer is to reject this stuff and just put it and make fun of it. And it's like, I don't know. I, I, I think that'll probably, that, that'll probably be the snake eating its own tail at some point. Mm.
Mm. Yeah, I remember you, you making that point about psychology and feeling that it was quite a profound realization because I think a lot of these ideas conversations can can become almost unrooted from the human world yeah. of status, prestige, um, and, and then sort of, then you get some kind of incentives become aligned within any kind of network or any kind of organization and then you're then you can be in trouble very quickly i mean ironically eric weinstein we did a film with eric weinstein that we called glitch 2 the origin of the idw and he talked about the dangers of groupthink and how the idw was a set of disagreeable characters but then you've got the paradox of when you create a tribe of non-tribal individuals what then happened? Yeah, well, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe, you know, I, I used virtue signaling as my example in the last answer to ponder, but tribalism is probably the same kind of um, challenge or facet of human psychology. We are, we, to deny our evolutionary residue of being a tribal animal is, uh, is, is foolish. I mean, you, you, that's, it's probably just a truth that we are. Again, we have to do the same sort of decision if you're going to try to stamp that out as some sort of um, just always toxic and always problematic feature or it's something that you could could you build a tribe a moral tribe or an ethical tribe or a philosophical tribe um, yeah I guess I'm less afraid of the word tribal than probably a lot of people I see commenting online and and pointing out this tribalism it's a da it's a powerful feature you know an example that, that I think I've also used is like something like tribalism. I I want to contend. Okay, this is an open question. If it's if it's a morally neutral phenomenon of the psychology of the type of animal that we are, if it is, it's like splitting the atom. When you split the atom it, with with a with a fission reaction and a huge amount of energy comes out, and you discover that that's a that's a morally neutral thing that those are just you know those are just quarks splitting at some level and a bunch of other quarks flying off of it and um, you have choices of what you want to do with that you've discovered something incredibly powerful when you've discovered fission or fusion either of them you can put it on the back of a spaceship and go explore the cosmos if you want with it. You could probably put it in some kind of engine and engineer a bunch of other machines around it and try to cure cancer. Or you could put it on the back of a warhead and go kill each other. The splitting of the atom was morally neutral. It's all about how we apply it and how we, we, we direct it. This is my whole thing about sort of can you notice that thing and then hijack it for some ethical means? This totally kicks the can down the, the road of the philosophical questions that I'm really interested in are of what are ethical means and these big philosophical questions, which I hope is more of the conversation in the IDW. But if, if that analogy holds and the tribal instinct of the human animal is a powerful, we know it's a powerful psychological phenomenon that could lead very quickly to awful, awful horror shows and nightmares, but could also lead very quickly to, to beautiful you know, dreams and, and fulfillment of, our, of potential and exploration and all the, those lovely things that you hope. So do we have to, again, do the same thing of just call it this... Um, Call it this necessary, just evil, and then and then walk away from it totally. Um, I, I, you know, I'm agnostic even to that point, but I think in in to Eric's point probably about what what you want in sort of in any system you want a method of error detection and correction. David Deutsch is my favorite thinker. I think I tweet about him more than anyone else. I'm a huge fan of David Deutsch's work, and he sort of pins that. Um, sentence as may, if there's a commandment of the universe that you could try to derive from the universe itself in the famous is off distinction, it would be something like that. That uh, <clears throat> sustaining and building the systems to detect and correct errors, of course you have to decide what an error is, and that's a different philosophical question, is the most important thing. And for that, Eric's right, for thinkers, you, what you want is an incubator that can detect and correct errors. Um, and if it becomes tribal and it has biases that start building within it, that, it, that there's certain errors that just are never detected. Maybe I'm pointing to some of the errors of like 
you know, pretending that we're animals that suddenly don't want sex because we're sitting in an IDW room or something like that. You, you, want, you want an ability to detect and correct errors and open discussion in, in, a, in a culture of, of criticism is, um, is important to uphold. So in, in that respect, tribal thinking, if it becomes, um, if it becomes unable to, to correct itself, is, is, I would say, an objective wrong and an objective evil in the universe to sort of borrow some more Deutschian language. So, uh, yeah, we have to be, be careful of that. I, I, don't know, I don't know if Eric has any, can, you know, any ideas about how to contend with that in something like the IDW conversation. It has to be cared for and nurtured all the time. And maybe there's an overcorrection of inviting people into the IDW who are... Um, obviously politically different from, from you in order to try to sustain that, which, which, can, which can go too far. I mean, you can, ex you, what's, there's some famous bad quotes about be careful not to open your mind so far that it falls out or those kind of things. It's like, you, you can go a little too far being like, okay, this person is like totally different from me in every other way. So perfect, they should be in the room with me. That, that might not be true. They might just be, totally wrong and they might not be open to correction and they might have completely wrong ideas. Um, I, I guess what, what we need to be able to do in that conversation is if it is a group of people and we're imagining some sort of room with an IDW sort of sign on the door and you let someone in the room who is, is just fundamentally different than you in the way they think and the way they see things, Cool. Let them in the room. I get the I get the 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 value of having them in the room. But once they're in the room, don't be afraid to challenge them and push them on these things and try to discover truth. Like I said, because there are there are ideas and conjectures about the way the universe is, even in the moral sphere, that are that cannot coexist and and they both cannot be right. That's what I, I hope what's exciting about, oh, come in the room, we're gonna, we're gonna hash this out, we're gonna figure this out. We might not get to the bottom of it, but we're gonna record this and we're gonna do a three hour long thing and we're gonna get into it. And, may, and maybe I think some of the distaste comes from people watching some of these IDW conversations and not seeing enough of that. It's a lot of like giving a pass being like, oh, well, you know, they think really different than, differently than me, so that's why they're here. And it's like, yeah, they think really different than, differently than you, and you're right, so go, go hash it out. And maybe there, you know, it seems to be a little, not enough of the latter part of that recently, maybe. So yeah, the other big point was the Pangburn fiasco. I mean, Pangburn obviously put on the Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson events, and then a few events in Australia. I think only one actually took place, and then they folded. Um, so obviously there was some kind of inertia or um, sense of forward momentum that was stopped around that time of having all of the IDW members on stage with each other talking about things, discussing things. But it's also interesting looking at the, the other financial uh, draw or the other financial blocks to having these conversations because just, just having looked at from, as, as someone who puts on events, as an organization that puts on events, we've looked at the financials it's almost impossible to have what you want to have, for example, would be a sort of Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, or Eric, Sam Harris, Douglas Murray, a few people on stage. It's very hard to get those financials to work. Uh, yeah, the, the speaking fees are, are real. So if you're talking about market forces, um, these are all people who have kids trying to go to college and they have house payments and they get paid. Um, this is this is their life and their job. I mean, increasingly more and more for authors, the live show is, is a, a big revenue stream more than selling books. It's happened the same way even in music. It's like you only make this much on Spotify, but you go sell out shows. That's where you make money. Um, so yeah, that's a reality that we are contending with in these things and, and is, a real, um, is a real shame. This is to your point about the Weinsteins and, and saying that intellectual comment what was the quote that truth seeking can't survive market forces yeah that's um that's probably a really good concrete example of the, if the market force is you know people's kids need to go to college and they need to get paid on stage and and you can and no one's going to spend three hundred dollars to go see a, a hour-long event well you know yeah like you said you've done the numbers so trying to tackle that hurdle 
I don't know what, what the answer will be. There might be technological ways to tackle it. Live streaming, maybe you can lower the ticket prices. We can, as people like you and I, who are who sometimes entrepreneurs in that sense, you try to work out the numbers and maybe there's solutions out there, but you're fighting against, you're fighting against, um, you're fighting against those market forces and people's that, that are real for people. I don't know the right answer. I mean, is it, are people getting greedy? Like that's a question that I think we're going to also have to just contend with and critics of the IDW who, this goes to that general point of bad psychology and bad philosophy. Um, greed is one of those things we all contend with. Like how much money is too much money? If someone offers me $5 million to read an ad for a product that I don't agree with on my podcast, am I gonna read it? Well, $5 million is a lot of money. I could tell you right here being like, no way, but you put that check in front of me and you know, we all should be like, that's a real tough no to say. So. <laughs> You know, it's it, again. There's there. This isn't to cast the, the seek for moral purity will be the death of any movement. So we shouldn't have that. We should acknowledge that these are real factors and people need to get paid. Um, but is there a limit? Is there a point where someone's gotten paid enough? Is there a point when, you know, the 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 importance of what's going to be said on stage should be enough to to sort of lower the price? Yeah, you know, who am I to, who, who, who are, are any of us to say this stuff? But I think probably ignoring these questions or having it at this dark, dirty secret in the intellectual world is probably a big mistake. We should talk about these things and be honest about these things. Sam, I think, has been more recently, um, and, and probably rightfully so, when, when you're that sought after and you have a lot of, of people who, you know, you have a lot of people asking for your attention, just setting a price of entry to, to get me in the door is probably a decent filter to weed out some of the wasting of your time. Yeah. But you could use that to justify high fees to a certain degree. And um, I don't know. Yeah, we're all, we're all contending with that. Maybe, maybe what we see a lot of times is, is this trajectory of someone who seemingly organically comes from nowhere and is everywhere and doing really good work. And then they hit some level where suddenly they stop outputting new ideas that's probably, and they start, as you were mentioning with Jordan, like how much can you tour this one book before you just write maybe the same book and then tour that one again, because you hit this level that you just, the incentives to create new ideas and new innovative ideas um, is is unplugged at some certain point. Um, that That's a real shame that I think, yeah, that, that we're all, we, that, that probably has to be addressed and talked about in some way. Um, but yeah, we, I think we all have to contend with that. Something that I was really um, excited about at the beginning of the sort of the emergence of the IDW, and I first found out about it through the Rubin Report, and a couple of shows on on the Rubin Report. I remember one with Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson, and another one with Brett and Eric, where you just really got the sense of a conversation that was going somewhere, and because in, implicit in the way that the IDW is framed is that people might change their minds, that you yeah. could you. And I, I haven't had that same sense of excitement or haven't seen that same sense of excitement in many of the conversations that I've seen since, especially with those core group from, yeah. from, from the beginning. And, and, and there's a kind of aliveness to a conversation where someone might change their minds or they're open-mindedly inquiring into something and there's a curiosity and there's an, evol an evolving perspective on both sides. And I haven't felt that kind of alive quality from many of the dis discussions that I can remember, probably over the last few months or so. Yeah, I think I, I think I feel the same kind of. I you know I know a lot of these guys personally, and I basically keep saying I you know I'm like write more books, like put something out, put out an original thesis. Let's talk about it. Let's argue about it. Um, yeah, I, I, if some I don't know, I can't remember the last time I've seen in yeah in the conversation of mind change in real time like that. Um, well, maybe I've seen some of them go the wrong, <laughs> the wrong way, actually. Um, I mean, there's, there's a topic like abortion is out there that gets tossed around a little bit in this. And there's totally, if the IDW is a group of people and we have sort of the same names in mind, there are disparate outcomes of that question that are just there as a mess on the floor in that IDW room that really ought to be looked at and picked up. Because I think there are, there are definitive right and wrong answers in that space or definitive better and worse questions to ask to probe that that aren't even being asked. I mean, Dave Rubin has been at the center of a lot of the criticisms of the IDW that we've seen 
especially in the last few months, I think. And I actually had an interview with him where I put a few of those questions to him because I had a look back at some of the previous shows and I, I kind of agreed with... It's not, it's not whether you have certain people on your show. I mean, I think you, you completely should have free reign to, to have anyone and speak to anyone. But it's about whether you're giving the audience enough perspective, giving them enough information to make up their minds about who these people are. And, and I think valuable questions can be asked. And, and you mentioned about sort of that, the, the need for self-correction. And I, we, I think it's fair to say we've not really seen that with, with Dave Rubin. We've seen him get very, very defensive, very, very triggered by a lot of the, the, the criticism that he's getting. Yeah, yeah, he, yes, <laughs> he does not, if you point out errors, he doesn't seem to take it, um, he doesn't seem to take it in, in good faith, and maybe it's not from everyone in good faith, but um, I have a lot of open questions about watching what's happened with Dave Rubin, and I don't, so I want to preface this again, whenever I talk about Dave, I don't mean this personally, I, I want, I want to put out, I interviewed him for my film, didn't make the cut, but he was gracious to give me his time, and um, I've, I've met him a few times, and he's a really nice guy. None of this is meant to be uh, a personal attack on, on Dave Rubin. But I have open questions about watching, watching his sort of trajectory, as, as you said, sort of in this conversation, um, where, gosh, I don't know a polite way to say this, but I wonder if we underestimated the well there's the intellect and the intelligence that maybe it takes to um sort of walk away from a tribe that you were captivated by because suddenly you're in the wilderness and it's a dark place and maybe going back to sort of the the tribal instincts we have the lore of finding a new tribe you might not even be conscious of it but is there because it's safe. There's safety in numbers and it's dark in the wilderness and you want to be near other <laughs> warm animals who provide all this protection in some evolutionary way. Again, like these things are not unique to Dave. These things are not unique to any of us, but uh, they might, you know, they, things are not distributed even, evenly in the world and Dave might have a, um, a, a high, you know, a potent version of that in his own psychology. I think famously, uh, stand-up comics always sort of get knocked for you know they're they're they just want validation it's like their their whole thing maybe he was selected a little bit for this kind of of entrenchment and and you know maybe by accident he's got himself entrenched but talking about Dave Rubin in this way as I think you and I are trying to do as again I don't mean this to be dismissive or some jerky thing to say but as a cautionary tale that walking into the wilderness and finding yourself in the wilderness, or as Dave would probably put it, he didn't go anywhere, the left left him or whatever, finding yourself in the wilderness is a vulnerable, dangerous spot to be. And it's a, and it's, and it's a, it's a time where maybe it, you, you could fall, you could fall into conspiracy theories very easily in that state. You could fall into violence in that state. You could fall into a lot of directions in that state that we, um, again, I, I, I've, <laughs> I don't mean this to be condescending, but I have compassion for the, I, I will just call it the mistake that Dave has made of ending up, well, hopefully not ending, but being in the place where he's in now. Um, because I think we all, I don't know how it would have gone for me in the post 9-11 waking up period that I had, which was just much earlier than Dave's to sort of some of the lunacy on the left. If I had Twitter and I had a YouTube channel that I could just start like this, maybe I like we're all Dave Rubin on some level. We all have a little Dave Rubin in us, and maybe he was a bit unlucky. Just even given the place where he lives, he's he's in Los Angeles, and he could pick up the phone and call Sam Harris and get him on his first show, and get a huge audience. I mean, a lot of things had to fell in place for Dave Rubin to to be Dave Rubin. It probably would have been better for him if he was just a kid in Minnesota without those connections who would have maybe gone through that initial, I don't know, angst and like wanting to like throw a middle finger up to the left that abandoned him when maybe the audience wasn't so big and maybe he would have sorted some of these things out and seen in the mirror a little bit of like, okay, this, this might feel good for a minute, but this is not, this is not where the real show is. I was also a fan of Dave Rubin's show, you know, at the beginning and enjoying a lot of these conversations. I think having a hunch that he was in a vulnerable spot. But I remember pretty clearly the moment where I was like, man, 
Yeah, like personally offended by it. So I will take this one personally, and you could call this one a bit of an attack. But people like you and I in this field of storytellers trying to amplify this with the video tools that we have here, um, I take the job really seriously. I know it's you could take it too seriously sometimes, but I take it really seriously that it's a privilege to be able to have these conversations, and it's a huge responsibility to be able to be able to have these conversations and to edit these things. I mean, taking taking hours and hours of footage of someone with really big ideas that they've spent years crafting and working out and being very careful about the language they choose, and then you and I are the ones who have the like task to try to deliver that to an audience who might only have 10 minutes in their car, that's a, I take it seriously. And so I do a ton of homework. If I'm gonna interview someone, you know, I'm doing this podcast now and I have these people that I'm interviewing, I read their books, I read articles, I try to dig in as much as I can, I talk to friends about it, I bat it around with myself. I spend a lot of time before the first question is asked with what, you know, with doing my homework. And, it became clear to me, actually this, this goes back to one of your questions about tribalism, it was an interview with Amy Chua. And Amy Chua wrote a book called Political Tribes that I absolutely love. And I read it and learned a lot from it. And it, and it shifted my thinking on actually this question of tribalism. I was probably honing a lot of her influence in my answer to you about tribalism as maybe it's not this evil thing to stamp out, but actually something to understand. And we, and we absolutely, uh, pretending it doesn't exist is a huge fatal mistake and has been a fatal mistake. It's a great book. It's a short book. I recommend everyone reading it. But I, I saw this happen where it was actually Michael Shermer, who was another person who I think who has made some mistakes. But Michael Shermer brought Amy Chua to Dave Rubin because Michael read her book and maybe also saw a lot of these things and liked a lot of it and also realized he's friends with Dave was like, oh, Dave really needs to hear this because Dave, you know, Dave's making some mistakes that this could really correct. He like brought her to the studio. And th when I watched their interview, it was Michael and Amy, and then I think he had Amy on solo. It was clear to me after five minutes that Dave Rubin, maybe he looked at a Wikipedia article at best, but hadn't read the book, hadn't done an ounce of homework of this thing. The questions he was asking were so, asinine to, towards her that, again, as someone in the industry who sits in his chair often, I was just offended by being like, you have this incredible intellect in front of you and someone who did a lot of work and you didn't even take the time to do the homework to read her book. And so on a personal level, I was offended by it. There might be some people who could get away with that, like a Joe Rogan could just come in and wing it and he's curious, but Dave has an agenda on that show. I don't care what he says about it. I'm just talking to people. If you watch that, well, he, maybe not an even agenda, but he has a, an opinion, a political opinion, which he's allowed to have. But if you're gonna ask the questions with some, with some narrative that you're looking for her answer to fit into, it's just totally disingenuous to your guests to treat them that way. And so just on a pure like filmmaker and promise to your audience and your guest level, I was, I was personally offended by that. One of my frustrations generally maybe with the, the corner of the IDW that Dave occupies is that there is the, the stereotype sort of SJW, 19 year old girl with purple hair and screaming about you know systemic racism or something on college campuses that rightfully should be lampooned and criticized. But there's also an opposite version of that of the 19 year old, usually boy wearing a bow tie who like read one Ayn Rand book and thinks that libertarianism is like, you know, is the only philosophy of the world that they'll ever need in their life. And, and they'll go about their, that person should also be lampooned because it's, they're both incredibly, we know, lazy and harmful ideological positions to be in. And so has Dave sort of allied with the stereotype on the other side in some ways? Certainly, I don't want to cast aspersions on his fans, but it, probably a lot of them are also his fans. They're, there's a deeper end of the pool. They're like waiting in the shallow end. I hope for Dave's sake of his own intellectual journey that he can break out of that and continue to go, but it's uh, he's found a lucrative shallow end, <laughs> I'll say that. I, I share your concerns about it seeming unfair to focus on on Dave, but I think the reason why the reason why I did the interview in the way that I did, and the reason that I'm kind of interested to return to it in the context of the IDW, is that that was, as Dave said in the interview with with me, his his garage was kind of the home of the IDW. It's where a lot of the initial connections were made, 
and it's where a lot so it is the place where when there are criticisms the the flaws in in dave's thinking and performance are then sort of massively highlighted i think there's a few different pieces that we can kind of unpack and they're all very useful um learning experiences for for all of us one of which is what happens when you replace a high resolution critique with a low resolution critique and i think that's something that's really important for the idw is how, how do you how do you how do you find a path through the, the sort of very complex arguments around say sex and gender for example without slipping into a low resolution critique these are very difficult conversations that have to be ha had at this sort of higher level and as soon as you come down to a low resolution partially true critique of the left for example then then you're that that's a really dangerous place to be yeah that's that's really interesting yeah i like that i mean just as the thought that popped into my mind it would be impossible but it's like we should somehow have like a <laughs> there should be a a podcast or a youtube situation where it's like impossible to only listen to five minutes like if you start it you ha you can't get out of like you can't get out of it for at least half an hour <laughs> because I, I think that's a really astute point though is is you know a little information can be a dangerous thing it's famously like the, the this mount stupid graph that you know you get a little information and suddenly you think you're a genius you get a little inf more information and you realize you got a long way to go um, yeah, it, yeah you could you could misunderstand and misinterpret really big ideas that are so it's like splitting the atom again it's like you can you can make some monumental mistakes if you misunderstand I've, I've been looking at you know Darwin and Darwinianism and the mistakes that people make about understanding evolution if you hear survival of the fittest and then you walk away and you think you know what that means and you go run with it you can you can make a horror show on earth pretty quickly um, because that idea is even wrong but even to just to, to know what's wrong about it, um, it takes a long time I think actually, you know, that's why someone like Sam Harris, who, who I love, obviously I work with, um, he's not, he's an incredible, we need more communicators of these things. Sam, Sam is a philosophy communicator. The way that Carl Sagan was a bit of a scientist, but really a science educator, because he had this incredible ability to study and understand big, complicated ideas of science, and then deliver it. With, in a pretty concise way that was entertaining and poetic and really would do the job. Sam is incredibly good at that. I mean, writing a book on determinism, he's, he's, not, he's not the first one. He's like the millionth and a half one to say that free will is an illusion. But he wrote a really cool short book about it and shorter than a lot of the other books out there on it. Um, and there's a, there's a real talent in that. I would say the moral landscape is probably you know, his original thesis that, that deserves critique as an original idea. But most of his books and most of his work is incredible philosophy communication. And that, that's a really valuable skill. And we, we need more of that, especially maybe in this, you know, attention span, as you were pointing out earlier, the incentives of traditional media where you only have, you know, a minute to speak. Uh, if, you can, if you can compress sort of, you know, hundreds of years of philosophical thinking into a, into a compressible thing. That's a, that's a really, really good skill. But of course, there are really bad ways to do it. There's bad ways to make a, a, a low resolution version of a file where you actually miss all the good stuff. Um, whether it's an image that just becomes so pixelated that you can't see what you're looking at anymore or, a, 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 you know, a, but there's really good ways to do it. Whatever algorithm turns you know a, a five gig wave into a hundred meg mp3 and still sounds really good that algorithm is a tremendously valuable tool and if you if that analogy works with almost the people who become the algorithms that can take you know terabytes of information and compress it and deliver it to you but that's not always doable or easy and we might we might not be there yet where you might need a three hour long podcast or four nights with Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson talking about truth and never getting anywhere. And I think they probably needed four more nights and they needed, and that's great. But that, you know, okay, that sometimes that's the best we can do is you're not gonna get this in five minutes. You're not gonna get this in a, in a minute because I don't get this in a minute. So, you know, it, if, I think Einstein has a lot of great quotes about that. Something like, if you don't understand it, um, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it, some, all this kind of stuff or whatever. But yeah, there, it's, a, it's a really, really crucial, important point. And maybe that's, again, the Dave Rubin criticism of like, you know, you, 
do more homework. It's the, the low the low resolution sort of, you know, Ben Shapiro owns an SJW is not helping anyone. So I want to kind of wrap up by coming back to a point that you made right at the beginning, which was the difference between politics or that your concerns about the IDW was that whether it was a political thing rather than a philosophical thing. And yeah, yeah that, that's a really interesting point because the nature of politics comes, if you sort of to break it down, it's not an inquiry. It's, it's yeah. when inquiry stops. It, it's, it's got an agenda. It's got an end. It's like when, when inquiry collapses into activism or collapses into politics, it, it, it lacks that kind of a live sense of curiosity and openness and, and evolution. And that's not, even, that's not even to not. That is what politics is. It's like we sat in the room, we thought about this, or we did the studies, and we, we, we're, we're going with this answer, and we're going to try to push it. We're going to try it out there in the world. And politics is how do we get enough people to pull the lever so we try this idea. That's, that is what politics is. Um, I, you know, I think like the natural pushback someone would have if they hear a criticism of, oh, the IDW shouldn't be political or is too political or something is, and I don't even know if this is a good point, they'll point out like, well, look at all these people with their disparate political ideas and their disparate political outcomes. I think that's a different point than the one I'm making. It is like, if it's people who are, are have political agendas, no matter what they are, um, which on, on some, some ways we all do, but if that's the practice of IDW is pushing a political agenda or even denigrating another political agenda just for the sake of something else, yeah, I, I think that's, not only is it boring, it's, it's just, um, it's, nothing, it's nothing new. It's not a reaction to anything. That's, probably, that's what we were doing before. It's just, it's just a political reaction to a political mistake. And that's not, that's not new. That's not why, I don't think that's why people came to the room. I think people came to the room because they had a hunch that there was questions that they couldn't ask and there was answers that they thought were out there or that there were answers that they had a hunch were, were um, you know, being pushed upon them that just couldn't possibly be true, whether on sex and gender, on all these big taboo topics on religion and violence, that was of course a big one of this has nothing to do with Islam, that line became this famous like, I have a hunch that it has something to do with Islam, let's talk about what that something is. And people came to these rooms to, to have open discussions and ask questions that were taboo. They weren't about like, hey, pretty sure the left is insane and don't you agree with me? It's like, sure, <laughs> but it's, you know, or it's like, hey, pretty sure Trump is a, is a liar and don't you agree with me? Um, yeah, that's nothing new. That's just a new, that's a new political, you know, club to get together. It's a, that's like a, it's a book club where you all read the same book and, and you want to go talk about it. There's a value to that, but it's not, I don't think that's like a sustainable, you know, movement in there. I, you know, my effort is to make philosophy cool and fun, and and sh and and show also to deliver as we're talking about to deliver to people who don't who think philosophy is some highfalutin word that they talk about on college campuses, and it's not for me. I, I'm trying to, and I think in a lot of ways the IDW at, in its early stages did do a lot of that introduction to people of like, oh wait, no, there's actually this is philosophy. This is cool, like. It's, it's not just pie in the sky stuff and it has real life implications and it can change my mind about things. And if you're in it for the self-help aspect, there's plenty of that if, if you want to extract that from it. But, you know, on the show I do with Coleman now talking about, you know, should you save the Mona Lisa or a person in a fire or one of our upcoming episodes is a couple that wants to intentionally uh, select genetically engineer a deaf child to be in the world. Are these ethical decisions like really big, crazy, fun stuff? Um, that, you know, I, I hope, I hope like the, 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 the barriers that were, that people were, were feeling were there, the barriers that they, they were feeling on their college campuses were there, the barriers that they were feeling on the media were there, the barriers that might be there because of the incentives of, of commercialism and capitalism and, and, and on mainstream, uh, you know, on the popular media, um, I hope all of, once all of those barriers are down, there's all there's there's barriers. Intellectual barriers also really should be should be brought down as well. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know if we're delivering on that promise or not. I, I I hope we're trying to reinvestigate it. And do you want to talk a little bit about the the app that you're that you're making at the moment? Because yeah. because that's a really interesting um, segue between 
the IDW as these sort of people on a stage or kind of well-known figures and how, how other people can join this kind of intellectual awakening. Yeah, well, there's a cool, I mean, people might be familiar with the founding story of it at this point. Um, I met Ryan Bennett, this is my partner with this, with this new um, program that we're, we're launching, um, in the middle of the Pangburn collapse. It was sort of just one of these random internet connections that happens where the, the famous Pangburn fiasco where they were going to do this huge show in New York and all these tickets were sold and then famously two days before the event he sends out an email saying he folded the company and anyway, huge fiasco but suddenly people were coming to New York and who all were sort of in this space on some level. They were coming to hear the likes of Jordan and Sam and all these names that we know. And we, a bunch of us sort of organically got together being like, can we do anything for these people? Like we have these contacts, like they're all coming here, let's do something. I think Ryan put out a random like Eventbrite tweet. He was one of the many who had bought a ticket who couldn't cancel it, who was coming anyway. I retweeted it, one of those random little viral moments, and I reached out to Ryan. Anyway, when I met him, we just became fast friends. Famously, the Pangburn event that didn't happen turned into this kind of impromptu party in Manhattan with at bars and at different places, and there was some uh, Skyping that came in with some of the figures like Eric Weinstein, who talked to people when he could uh, from afar, and uh, Coleman was there, Coleman Hughes. and. Um, you know, probably no surprise to anyone. So many people came away saying like this was better than the, if the event had even happened because on some level you buy a ticket to go see Sam Harris or or Eric Weinstein or whatever, and you kind of know what they're going to say. It's like going to see your favorite musician and like, oh, he's playing his greatest hits again. And it's great. It's great to hear. Maybe I'll improv a little this time and do something new or here's a new song. It's great. But really you're there in so many ways to like be with other people who are also have their ear to the ground of this conversation. Um, and so what, what we launched was, and then, and then to, to finish that maybe frustration is then the event ends and everyone goes home and it seems like the only thing to do is maybe like yell about it on Twitter and that's about it. And it's, we're seeming, we're, we're missing something to connect the people, to change the conversation from the one to many that happens when one person's on a stage and many people are out here to the many to many and how do we do that? So I think it's a really simple idea. We're calling it In Common and we just started doing some tests at the Soho Forum in New York, which are going well very early, where it's pretty simple. You come to the event and you get a code, uh, and it's a code that only people at the event have access to. And you sign up for the code, you answer just a few simple questions of like when you're available, what kind of food you like to eat, what neighborhood you're in, really simple stuff. We do all the algorithm work behind the scenes and hook you up with other people who went to the event, five or six people, whatever it is, you, there's plus ones. And then you go and have dinner with these people or brunch and they launch, it's in your neighborhood and it's, it's could be the next day or a few days later or even on the weekend and meet them and see what happens and continue the conversation. And that's it. It's just about, it's simple. The work is up to you. We'll just connect you at the, at the dinner table and then, you know, make some friends and error correct at the table if you want to continue the discussion or talk about whatever you want. Um, yeah, it's in some ways it's what meetup.com should have been. <laughs> we, we have a hunch the meetup.com uh, effort is sort of dissatisfying uh, because there's kind of no velvet rope, you know, like who the hell's going to show up at these things and weirdos from the internet are going to be there. If, you, if you're spending money to go see a Jordan Peterson talk and taking time out of your night and so did these other, you know, 400 or 500 people they got through the velvet rope that might be enough of a selection process that, hey, you might have a nice time at dinner with them, or maybe not. And then we make it really easy after the dinner uh, to stay in contact with the people you want to stay in contact with. It's totally private, and we keep all that sort of, you know, in, in your control. But it's a really simple app, and it's a really simple program that we're just, like I said, we're in the, the alpha beta sort of mode of it called In Common. Um, hopefully, yeah, it, it does a lot of good. It's, it's one of those simple but eminently achievable techno technologically you know achievable ideas that we're like let's let's just build it no one's built this thing yet and so Ryan's a really good programmer and we're off to the races so look for in common at events that will be popping up a lot more in uh, 2020 but uh, yeah we're, we're going through the if you're in New York and you come to the Soho forum you might see it I think the next debate is about Bitcoin or something so I'm sure we'll get a bunch of people if you want to go have dinner and talk to people about Bitcoin I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> there's people out there who do it isn't that just any dinner party pretty much anywhere <laughs> yeah that's actually just Brooklyn now at this point is like who someone will bring up Bitcoin and then you'll fight about it so 
Um, but yeah, it's uh, Ryan's great. So we're 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 hoping to yeah. Cool. I hope it works. Yeah, me too. Yeah, real real pleasure to speak to you and catch up again soon. Yeah, thanks, man. That was fun. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.